My name is Zach Verse Lewis. I'm a water conservation specialist for Aurora Water. And uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, introduction to uh, waterwise landscaping. Um, waterwise landscapes, which are also known as uh, xeriscape, um, it's not just uh, a landscape style, but it's uh, it's also a set of principles that provides direction and best management practices to save water and sustain an attractive uh, lower maintenance landscape that requires fewer environmental resources. So by the end of the presentation, uh, you'll be able to define waterways landscaping and its seven principles. Are two examples. The uh, design on the left utilizes clusters of plants uh, with a relatively small plant palette. Um, there's probably not more than 10 species there. It also demonstrates the effective use of uh, blue grama as a turf alternative. Uh, and we've also got some uh, woolly thyme back here. Now, the blue grama as a turf alternative is, um, is only so in an aesthetic function um, because um, it does not tolerate sustained foot traffic. The design on the right uh, provides a kaleidoscope of uh, color and texture with a larger and more varied plant palette of shrubs and perennials interspersed with one another. And both of these examples provide a lot of color and multi-season interest. And what, uh, what's the most important thing that we, or one of the most important things that we see here? Lots of color and it is not a barren landscape. Like this. Uh, this is zero scape. Uh, this is not what uh, this is not the type or style of landscaping that we're encouraging uh, homeowners uh, to adopt. Um, now, when we're when we're talking about zero scape, um, it frequently uh, is misinterpreted for zero scape just because of the way it sounds. Zero scape, zero scape, xeriscape, um, and so we've we've stopped using the word except for references purposes only. And now we simply call it waterwise landscaping. And as you can see, they are very, very different types. Um, this right here is a, well, it's a nice curvy line. It, um, but uh, it, it's, it's barren. It doesn't provide uh, any habitat for, uh, um, for, beneficial insects or birds, and it's also a heat trap. This type of landscaping is not permitted in the city. So there are several benefits of waterwise landscapes. Uh, it is a means of increasing seasonal interest through color and texture. Um, and as I previously mentioned, um, it, it provides habitat for songbirds, beneficial insects. Um, it's not maintenance free, but requires the bulk of the maintenance to be done in the spring. Uh, weekly maintenance includes a walkthrough of to look for weeds, to uh, pick up trash, and eva evaluate plant health. And uh, once established though, um, it requires much less maintenance than cool season turf. Use uh, depending on the plants that are selected and our watering practices, uh, it can reduce water use for an area by almost 90%. These are the seven principles of a waterwise landscape planning and design, practical turf areas or turf alternatives, low water use plants, soil improvement efficient irrigation, mulch, and maintenance. So planning is one of the most uh, important principles. It, uh, it's really a process, one that involves setting specific goals, 
um, for you, your family, uh, identifying what you are doing and why, researching materials, methods, means of installation, costs, um, existing site conditions such as slope, exposure, soil type, and incorporation of the remaining principles to, um, to provide clear direction and lead to a successful project. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, sim um, to sum up all of, um, all of the, the little parts of the process. Um, and we found that a, uh, we've also found that well-planned uh, projects will ultimately save money. Now, the, the design that we see on the screen is um, just a hand-drawn design but it is considered a professional design um, because we have uh, all of the pertinent information. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, we see a scale um, and not just, a, um, not just a numeric scale, but also a graphical scale. So um, whether the image is um, enlarged or reduced, it will still um, be in proportion. Uh, we've got North Arrow. We have a list of the plant material um, and uh, symbols related to them. Now, one thing um, also to note about this um, this plan is that the plants were drawn to, to near mature sizes. We're not just seeing a little dot on on the uh, on the design. Um, those those circles uh, are the approximate sizes of the plants. Is it okay to have cool season turf? Answer to that is yes. The challenge is the challenge is finding a balance between how much you need um, and how much you want, and really whether you need to have any at all. Uh, so one of the things to ask yourself is the need aesthetic or is it functional? Um, aesthetically, we may um, say aesthetically high water use turf. Um, provides an area of uniform color and texture that's pleasing to the eye. Um, but a sim similar uniform uh, color and texture can be achieved uh, with low water use grasses or ground covers. Um, that we call a, a turf alternative. The functional benefit of a high water um, use grass is that it holds up well to foot traffic. And, uh, there's, there's pretty not pretty much uh, no other alternative uh, for that. Um, but this desirable characteristic of um, the sustaining foot traffic um, comes at the cost of requiring a lot of water, and that's okay, um, you know, as long as we're we're putting it to use. Otherwise, we do have uh, parks across uh, Aurora that. Uh, Play with the dog, play with the kids, et cetera. So if an area of your grass is, is rarely used, but you're keen on maintaining a similar look, consider removing it and using um, a turf alternative, such as um, a low water grass or uh, some um, mat forming ground covers. This is the fun part. <laughs> so waterwise landscaping uh, really is about the plants. And uh, one common misconception is that the palette of plant material that we have to work with consists of cactus, yucca, and other succulents. And uh, such is not the case, as you can see. Um, the 20, uh, 20 plants shown on this slide are but a small demonstration of um, the options that exist. Now, um, plants, there are plants that are native to Colorado and, um, or, or even more specific, native to, native to the Front Range. 
And uh, those types of plants are optimal for a water-wise landscape, but there are also a lot of non-natives that work well. And there's nothing wrong with using the non-natives. Um, these, these other plants, we call them adapted, come from uh, um, other places around the world with sim similar climatic conditions, which is why they perform well here. Uh, there are several uh, local resources to help you get acquainted with the plant. Um, and I will be uh, sending that out uh, after the presentation. Why do we amend the soil? So soils along the front range are typically pretty low in organic matter. Um, that low quantity of organic matter is ideal for our native plants. Um, but some of the plants that we may use um, may not be native and may appreciate some richer soils. So, and, and typically when we're talking about soil amendments, we're referring to compost or, or, or organic matter. Um, improves the physical properties of soil and helps provide necessary nutrients to the plant. Um, it, in the case of a standard soil, it will increase uh, uh, water holding capacity um, and allow plants to breathe more readily or, uh, or freely in clayey soils. Uh, now not all composts are the same. We uh, specifically recommend class one or class two composts. Um, and a list of these composts can be found on the uh, lawn and irrigation permit page of the Aurora Water website. The reason why we uh, recommend um, a class one or class two composts is because they have to go through some testing. Um, so we find that they're lower in salts we, uh, we don't want salt buildup in our soils. Um, if we're amending a, uh, an area where we're gonna put turf, that's typically okay because we're gonna be pushing so much water on, um, onto the, putting so much water onto the, the grass that it's gonna move the, through the soil profile. Uh, another, uh, another benefit of compost is that it has a low um, quantity, typically has a low quantity of nitrogen. Now, all plants need nitrogen, um, but too much will burn plants or even kill them. Um, manure is a great example. Um, if you've ever bought a bag of manure at uh, uh, or wherever you would buy it uh, and felt it, it's usually pretty warm. That, that heat is an uh, indication that there are still chemical processes going on within the product. Um, meaning that it is not done composting or cooking. And as a result, um, sometimes the levels of nitrogen are just so high that it will burn the plants. And so using a product like that um, in a low water landscape where the plants do not need a lot of nitrogen can, um, like I said before, can burn them. It can cause um, unsustained growth. I know this from personal experience. Um, I, I used a, a composted manure that apparently wasn't composted enough. Um, put plants in there, my ice plants, which typically only get two or three inches tall, were about eight inches high. They did not survive the winter. So stick to a, stick to a class one or class two compost. Um, so not all uh, low water plants like organic matter, as I indicated. Uh, native plants are accustomed to really lean soils. So for some, it's best to use an inorganic amendment such as pea gravel, uh, expanded shale, though that uh, can be kind of costly, uh, or angular sand, which is also known as mason sand um, when you're planting in a clay soil. So uh, playground sand is, uh, is something that should never, ever be used if you have a clay soil. Because that basically just creates, helps create concrete. 
And uh, we don't want our plants grown in concrete. We want to prepare the ground so um, that it's a good uh, planting area for the plants. Um, there are a few ways we can determine uh, the type of soils that we have. One is by sending a soil sample to Colorado State University Soil Lab. Uh, for a small fee, they will analyze the soil type and also provide uh, recommendations for the types of fertilizers that should be used for your application. Uh, another is by uh, grabbing some soil in one hand, adding a little bit of water, and then trying to create a quarter uh, inch thick ribbon by pushing the soil out um, between your thumb and your pointer finger. And as you're doing this, um, if, if, you're, uh, if, the, if the soil uh, just keeps breaking off, then you probably have a pretty sandy soil. But if you're able to create a ribbon that is a couple inches in length, then there's a lot of clay in the soil. And lastly, um, this is this is one that can be fun with uh, with kids. Uh, get a quart size canning jar, fill it halfway with soil, fill the remainder with water, and shake it vigorously until all the soil is mixed. Um, and then immediately set it on the counter um, for about twenty four hours. Now um, there are three types three. Um, soil particles that make up all of our soils. We've got sand, silt, and clay, and those are in order of size. Sand is the heaviest, so it's going to fall out of the water the first. Um, so whatever uh, falls out of the water right after you put the jar on the counter, that's going to be the sand. The silt is going to start falling out next, and uh, then the clay will stay into solution um, almost for 24 hours. But um, once the water is mostly clear, we can see through it at least, then um, it is ready for us to uh, go on to the next step. So what you're gonna do is take a ruler and you're gonna measure the total soil, amount of soil in that jar. And then you're gonna measure just the section of sand, um, the section of silt and the section of clay. So you're not gonna be able to get it exactly right, but we'll get into the ballpark. And so let's just say you have four inches of soil in the jar um, and uh, two, and a half, uh, two and a half of the inches are sand. We're gonna do two and a half divided by four and that's gonna give us a percentage. Now let's go to the uh, internet where we can perform a search for a soil triangle. And the soil triangle is going to, uh, is gonna, have, is gonna be labeled with sand, silt, and clay. And we just use the that we calculated for each based on our soil type and the triangle will tell us uh, you know what type of soil we have whether that's a, a sandy soil a sandy clay loam a clay loam a silty clay loam there are numerous soil types so really the most important um, the most important thing to know when it comes to our soils is is it more of a sandy soil or is it a clay soil uh, another, another little test that you can do is to dig a little bit of a hole and um, fill it with water and see how long it takes out or how long it takes to drain. If uh, it drains relatively quickly, then you have a faster draining uh, soil, probably a lot of sand in it and not a lot of clay. But the longer it takes for the water to drain, the more clay or fine particulates uh, you've got in the soil. Um, and that's fine. One soil isn't necessarily better than another. It, uh, it just tells us how we need to water, um, water the plant material and also could suggest what type of soil amendment to use. In a, at Aurora, uh, at water conservation, we uh, classify mulch uh, into two categories, organic and inorganic. Um, 
regardless of the type, uh, we recommend that three inches be used. Uh, three inches of mulch uh, prevents sunlight from reaching the soil, keeps uh, the soil cool, thus reducing evaporation, and also discourages seed germination. Uh, it, um, it reduces the potential for erosion during heavy rainstorms, um, allowing water to uh, work its way in more into the soil more slowly. Um, a downside of mulch is that sometimes with a really, really light rainstorm, the only thing that gets wet is the mulch and um, none of that water will reach the soil. But overall, mulch provides a great benefit. We're, uh, we're frequently asked about the use of fabric. And typically when it comes, typically we don't like to see fabric used uh, where plants are gonna be planted, but um, you know, it, there are times when it is beneficial and ultimately if you decide to use it, that's okay. Um, we always recommend using it underneath rock. Um, over time, just the weight of the rock it tends to, it, it, it'll kind of push its way down into the soil and it really creates a, a mess. And then, you know, you're just more likely to uh, have to buy additional rock, put it down, it will continue to push its way into the soil. And uh, that's not really ideal. Um, so putting fabric down can really help to keep the rock clean. Um, now dirt and debris is always going to, you know, settle in the rock. And so we would recommend blowing it out um, a couple times a season. Um, but when it comes to organic mulch, uh, we don't recommend the use of any fabric. And the reason why is because organic material is gonna be decomposing over time. And basically it's gonna create a really nice compost layer at the bottom of the mulch. Um, that compost layer uh, really should uh, be adjacent to the soil. Um, worms, um, other invertebrates, microorganisms are going to appreciate that compost being there and they're going to help work it into the soil as well. And um, ultimately it's gonna create a more healthy soil. A healthy soil will have healthy plants. Um, plastic sheeting is a no-no in the landscape. So under no circumstances should it be used. Fabric isn't going to stop weeds from growing. It will inhibit um, or can inhibit their growth depending on the fabric used. Um, and it certainly makes pulling weeds that start growing on top of the fabric easier. Um, but uh, in a lot of cases, it's, it's just not necessary. So efficient irrigation really depends on the person turning the water on and off. Uh, if you've got an automatic irrigation system, uh, be sure to seasonally adjust the clock water turf in cycles, uh, use a rain sensor, even if you have a water-wise landscape, uh, use a rain sensor because um, if it's raining outside, especially a nice slow rain for a couple days, there's no reason for the water to come on. Um, and then perform regular maintenance, whether that's weekly or, or, or monthly, you know, go zone by zone, um, having the sprinklers on and check to make sure the heads are functioning correctly. So really um, efficient uh, irrigation depends on you. Um, we have seen uh, customers convert uh, their landscapes and actually increase water use. Now that would be expected if we're not applying any water to the landscape at all prior to conversion but um going from a healthy turf to waterwise landscape we should see an immediate decrease so this graphic right here is is demonstrating uh, the amount of water that uh turf um, uses compared to a traditional waterwise landscape and a water-wise landscape using ultra-low water plant material. 
green section, plants are happy. Yellow, they're starting to get a little bit stressed. And red, uh, that's when we see mortality. Kentucky bluegrass, which is the dominant grass in, in most of our lawns, um, is a little drought tolerant, but it's still going to, um, it's it still cannot uh, withstand sustained periods of no water. So um, if we stop watering the turf, you know, uh, July and in August, it's going to take a, a significant decline. And while most of it may come back in the fall, um, we're going to probably have to do some overseeding or um, or even replace some of the sod. Now, a water-wise landscape, um, we can, in many cases, we can go an entire summer without having to do any irrigation. Um, that's, you know, that's that's one of the benefits here. Now, we have waterwise landscapes uh you know set at uh 15 inches of water um this graph is showing the um, inches of water um looking or if uh, looking in literature uh most of it's going to say that waterwise landscapes take about 15 inches um, that's um, way more water than they need so Five to 10 seems to be a little bit more realistic, um, very doable, stressing the plants out a little bit in, you know, early on. Uh, we're, we've got some really hot temperatures this week, and no doubt the plants are going to be uh, experiencing a little bit of stress, but nights are still relatively cool. And so that the nights are offering a recovery period. Um, July and August, uh, when we have hot days and hot nights, is really where we need to be concerned um, um, about giving them some supplemental irrigation to help get them through, uh, through the season. But even still, you know, we're probably looking at no more than once a week and in some cases once a month. So that's the potential that um, can be achieved with a water-wise landscape. Instead of three, uh, three times a week, we're looking at once a week or even once a month and only in the hottest times of the year. Just to tell, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, inches of water and what that means. So when, when we're uh, performing consumption calculation, we're figuring out how much water a type of a plant um, needs, um, we talk about inches per square foot. So, uh, one inch of water is equal to 0.623 gallons. So over the course of a season, um, you're applying 17, about 17 and a half gallons per square foot for, of, of turf. That adds up to be a lot of water. So maintenance. Um, Spring cutback in, involves removing the previous year's growth uh, from ornamental grasses and perennials. Um, we take a look at shrubs and trees, um, trying to identify any winter damage and prune only if necessary. Now, when I say prune only as necessary, um, that's a reality because this goes back to the planning portion. We put plant material in locations where it should be planted. For example, um, I'm sure you've either lived in a place or have seen a, um, a house or a business who, um, you know, 30 years ago planted junipers right next to the sidewalk. And if they're still alive these days, um, the owner is having to trim them uh, so that people can get by. So we're dodging, you know, we're dodging all these junipers that were planted too close to the sidewalk. So it's not the plant's problem. It's the person who installed it. It's part of the planning process. We put a plant in a location recognizing that it's going to reach a certain height or width. So properly, um, and this is why uh, pruning 
isn't uh, commonly required in a waterwise landscape unless there's damage to a plant. So deadheading um, is removing spent blooms from plants um, before the seeds are produced. Um, the goal of a plant is to reproduce and it does that by creating a flower. The flower gets pollinated and then the seeds start forming. So if we clip that flower uh, as the, the quality of the flower starts to decline, then um, we will have prevented energy from going into seed production. That energy will remain within the plant and uh, the plant will produce more flowers. So deadheading is a way of extending the bloom season for a plant. Um, not, all, not all plants respond to that, but uh, most do. So there is no getting around having weeds, uh, regardless of the type of landscape, unless it's uh, concrete, we're all going to have weeds. And even with concrete, there are going to be weeds growing in the cracks. So. Um, the best thing you can do is identify what weeds are growing um, and what times of year they grow, and then take a, the uh, you know take the appropriate measures. Um, action that has the biggest impact, especially with the first couple of years, is weekly walkthroughs and make sure that not one single weed goes to seed, because one weed can produce hundreds and hundreds of seeds. And um, those seeds, once they get planted, um, you know, it exponentially becomes out of control. And so um, just make sure you're, you're going to have weeds, just make sure they don't go to seed. And as uh, I indicated before, organic mulch does decompose over time. And so um, assuming that you put down three inches to begin with, um, after about four years, you're going to have to add additional mulch. That's, uh, that's just that's part of having a water-wise landscape. Um, but one thing to take into consideration is the plants will have been maturing over time. So you're not going to be replacing all of the mulch. Um, um, you know, it's not adding another three inches over the entire area, only the areas that are really being seen. So that is, um, that is the presentation for today, uh, covering the seven principles of a water-wise landscape. Uh, you guys have any questions? You can uh, use the chat menu or the chat box to ask those questions. Daniel, great question. Um, where can we see some examples in Aurora of water-wise landscapes? Well, the Aurora, Aurora Water-Wise Garden at the Municipal Center is, um, is a great location. Uh, we've got a couple of projects going on right now, just installed a crevice garden, um, but there, uh, uh, there are about six acres of uh, formal beds there. Um, and uh, yeah, um, that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, I will also be sending out a PDF uh, that has some examples in it. Um, most of them are uh, first or second year photographs of, of properties. Um, on our website, uh, you can also take a look at uh, the awards that uh, uh, the Waterwise Landscape Award page that has got some um, examples as well. Megan, that's also a great question. Um, are there any edible plants that are water-wise? Absolutely, there are so many. In fact, more than, more than I even know of. Uh, 
vegetable gardens, uh, we, we classify them as water-wise. Um, if they are watered with a drip, um, you know, we can have fruit production with very little water. Um, personally, I've grown grapes, peaches, um, kale, lots of herbs, uh, you know, mints, um, oregano, uh, horseradish, um, you know, all these plants require very, very little water and do uh, uh, have culinary benefits to them. Um, tomatoes, like uh, tomatoes don't need a lot of water. The most important uh, um, the way to successfully grow tomatoes is have it consistently moist. So, you know, not big fluctuations of really wet and then really dry. So, uh, yeah, great question. Dave, uh, regarding next steps. So, we, next steps, we, um, we offer free design consultations. Uh, if you've got uh, grass that's in good condition in a front yard, uh, there is also a rebate available. Um, the application for the rebate is available on the Aurora Water website. That's aurorawater.org and click on conservation and rebates. Uh, it's a really quick application. Um, there are specific design requirements, but it uh, can provide up to $3,000 towards a front uh, a front and side yard or, or uh, the tree lawn area, streetscape. Unfortunately, we don't have a list of recommended companies. I would uh, recommend asking your neighbors or um, one of the social media sites for neighborhoods, um, but we're not uh, able to, um, yeah, we're not able to provide contractors. If you're interested in doing any of the work yourself, uh, we do have a class on the, the uh, it's a PDF on the website. Um, quality or waterwise landscape that will talk about um, some of the processes involved with that and potentially what you can do yourself, uh, what you may need to hire a contractor to do. Um, but it's uh it's worth taking a look. If you guys are interested in a design consultation, basically, um, our our process is this. Uh, well, with a design consultation, you uh, you typically meet with a landscape designer. That's not the case right now. Um, and so uh, I am. Uh, I, t I send out some information, or uh, excuse me, a couple of questionnaires asking for information. You are required to do a little bit of work, like put together a, um, a list of plants that you would like to see in your property. Um, it's not a complete list. We will modify it, uh, make other suggestions, et cetera. Um, you may need to do some measuring and uh, also send us some photos. Uh, the de landscape designer will, will create a design, send it back to you. Um, if you like it, great. If you want some changes made, we'll make those changes and uh, you're good to go. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that if you are in an HOA, uh, the state and the city have um, rules that protect you as a homeowner when it comes to, your, to landscaping that you are required to maintain. For example, tree lawn area, that area between the sidewalk and the street, um, it is typically community property, but you're required to take care of it. And as such, you get to decide whether it stays grass or um, is converted to a waterwise landscape. And that is regardless of what rules or bylaws your uh, covenant con controlled community has. Um, 
and uh, I can help you navigate that if you, if you do experience any issues with uh, your um, covenant controlled community. Um, the, um, but basically, they cannot. Um, you cannot be required to have turf on your property. Um, they can uh, impose specifics as to mulch color, some of the plants, you know, things like that, but they have to allow you to convert it. And it has to be zero escape. Like the two uh, photos we saw at the beginning of the presentation, you know, a, a, a landscape of plant material, not of rock. So using um, Carolyn, um, Carolyn uh, suggested ALCC.org, um, Associated Landscape Colorado, or Contractors of Colorado. You can certainly use that as a resource. Uh, for a landscape designer, uh, like I said, uh, we can provide that design or um, you, can, um, you can ask or, or hire that out. Um, many of the landscapers will also provide design services. Um, please, 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 if you are going to participate in the rebate program, make sure your landscape designer is aware of our design requirements. Um, and you're able to make a design yourself as well. Um, it just needs to um, have those professional uh, qualities like a scale. It needs to be drawn to scale. Plants need to draw, be drawn to mature sizes. And we need to have a plant list that uh, consists of botanic names. Now, I don't think, well, we have two Dans here. Dans here today. So um, the reason why we ask for botanic names is common names are, are like first names. You know, I can tell you guys to go out, um, go talk to Dan. Well, if we have, more than, uh, you know, since we have more than two Dan's, you're going to be asking me, well, I don't know who that is. Which one? Well, the same thing is with common names. Um, sage, for example. Some people put sage on pork. Other people grow up. So which sage is it? And botanic names, um, when we use botanic names, we don't run into those, um, those kinds of dilemmas. Dave, uh, thank you for the clarification on the web address. Oh, is there an advantage to rock versus, or organic versus inorganic mulch? Um, and the best percentage. So for the WaterWise Landscape Rebate, we recommend or we require at least two mulch types, and that is for um, some aesthetic variety. City code puts a limit on the amount of rock that we can have in a landscape, and that is no more than 50%. Um, as, to, um, as to rock versus mulch, um, it really, sometimes it depends on the location. Um, next to a sidewalk, uh, rock can be really beneficial, especially if that is a sidewalk where um, during a rainstorm, a lot of water uh, rushes by. Um, Water is going to just take mulch, organic mulch, and yeah, wash it down the street. Whereas if rock is there, it's going to stay put. Um, there are some plants that prefer um, prefer rock over over mulch. Um, that's that's a little uh, that, that's a tough one right there. And it, I, I'm not really um, to provide like a list of which what plants like what versus you know something else. Um, these are just kind of observations that we've seen in our demonstration garden, uh, stuff like that. What other questions do you guys have? If you're wondering um, back to what to do, um, if you're sold on the idea of a water-wise landscape, um, the next part is number one of the principle is to start doing some planning. 
um, looking at your budgets, looking at what you want um, with the, with the design, like we can certainly create a water wise landscape for you, but whether or not it's going to meet your needs um, really depends on what you want out of um, out of the project. Um, is it purely aesthetical or aesthetic or are you trying to create um, a more functional landscape, if you will? Um, adding rooms, um, you know, decreasing maintenance, um, pollinator garden, attracting birds. Those are questions, those are things that you need, you need to decide. And uh, once you've got that figured out, then we can better assist you with the, with the design. Um, once the design is done, if you are in a covenant controlled community, you'll need to get their approval. Um, and then you can move forward with it. If you plan on participating in the WaterWise landscape rebate, you must fill out the application. You must get approved. And then you also must have the design approved. It, it's not a hard process, but there are specific steps to follow. I mean, you know, we're paying out a lot of money here and we have to be good stewards of the money. And so um, we just want to make sure that uh, all the boxes are checked. We want, uh, and part, part of the reason why we have some of the requirements for the WaterWise landscape rebate that we do is uh, so you have a more successful experience. These, uh, these aren't arbitrary rules. They um, were developed um, over years and years of working with you guys. So, I will be sending out, just a reminder, I will be sending a, a PDF to you guys that um, has some example plants, has resources uh, to, for where you can look up plant material and learn more about it. Um, so, uh, be expecting um, the email will also include a survey uh, that you can give us some feedback about uh, the presentation today and uh, also uh, future classes. So we do rely on your feedback for making program changes. Uh, so um, please be critical. Critical is good. Is it, is it best, uh, this is a, a great question, um, is it best to wait until fall to tear out turf and plant? Um, <laughs> So I need to preface this by saying my background is in horticulture. I'm a plant geek. Um, plants don't like to be planted when it's 105 degrees outside. Um, but sometimes that's the only time we have to plant. Um, one of the challenges that we face is that as the season progresses, uh, plant material becomes sparse. And so your chances of getting the plants that you would like or that we recommended um, on the plan um, are going to decrease significantly. And it becomes, it, it really can become a struggle. So right now is a good time to plant. Um, it's also a good time to take out the grass. If you're uh, using the, uh, um, regardless of what method you're, um, you're going to use to get rid of the grass, now is a good time. And even a month from now, it's okay to plant. When it is hot outside, what happens is the plants are exposed um, or experience more stress. So that just means they're gonna need a little bit more THC from you. That does not mean that you need to be out there watering every day or twice a day. Um, you need to check to see if there's enough moisture in the soil. It's not difficult, but too um, much plants show can show stress um, in a way that it's difficult to determine whether it's because of heat or because of too much water. They'll they can droop in both cases. So if you see a plant droop but it's recovering at night, that's okay. You don't need to worry about that. That's a good sign, and it's probably simply to say that the root system hasn't developed enough that it can take water out of the soil and keep the top of the plant healthy. Um, there are a couple of things that we can do, we can do with this, um, do with that. When you're planting, cut the blooms off of a plant or, 
or the, some of the buds. You don't need to do all of them, but just some of them. That will reduce uh, plant stress. So. Did that answer your question? Uh, I don't think waiting uh, at this at this point. I don't think waiting until next year would uh, increase plant uh, selection or availability. Um, my understanding is that um, the plants are just now getting put out there, and some of them probably haven't even been uh, put out on the market yet. Now, Nix is probably going to, for example, I'm going to talk about Nix because, uh, as far as I know, they're the only nursery in Aurora. But Nix probably has a, a really good inventory right now, but there are certainly plants that they will also be getting over the next few weeks. So, you know, now's a good time. Waiting until the end of August is probably a little late to start getting plant material. September might be good for the shrubs. Um, it's not good for trees and it's not good for the perennials or ornamental grasses. Well, it's not ideal. So um, another part of that question would, is, uh, would waiting until next spring be better for tearing out grass while it's dormant? Not necessarily. In fact, it, it really depends on how you're going to tear it out. And some of these questions, um, I'm gonna defer you to the installation of a WaterWise landscape class, because it, it really depends on the method that you're using to get the grass out of your landscape. Really, grass can be grass can be removed physically removed any time of the year. It doesn't matter. Um, the only caution I have is if uh, there are existing trees, um, you want to be careful of them. Any other questions? are uh, about out of time. Um, you have my email address. I mean, uh, I'll uh, answer questions until 1 p.m., but you have my email address. Um, if something comes up, please feel free to uh, email me, uh, whether that's about this class or if you guys take a look at the installing a WaterWise landscape um, um, PDF. Uh, any questions about that, please, uh, please contact me. Uh, I appreciate you guys for your interest in WaterWise landscaping for um, being here today and uh, have a great rest of your week.